Absence by Walter Savage Lander Read for LibriVox.org by Florence Short Here, ever since you went abroad, If there be change, no change I see. I only walk our wanted road, The road is only walked by me. Yes, I forgot, a change there is. Was it of that you bade me tell? I catch at times. At times I miss the sight, the tone I know so well. Only two months since you stood here? Two shortest months? Then tell me why voices are harsher than they were, and tears are longer ere they dry. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Anti-Slavery Alphabet by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Ginger Cucolo To our little readers, listen, little children all, listen to our earnest call. You are very young, tis true, but there's much that you can do. Even you can plead with men that they buy not slaves again, and that those they have may be quickly set at liberty. They may hearken what you say, though from us they turn away. Sometimes, when from school you walk, you can with your playmates talk, tell them of the slave child's fate, motherless and desolate. And you can refuse to take candy, sweetmeat, pie, or cake, saying no unless tis free, the slave shall not work for me. Thus, dear little children, each may some useful lesson teach. Thus each one may help to free this fair land from slavery. A is an abolitionist, a man who wants to free the wretched slave and give to all an equal liberty. B is a brother with a skin of somewhat darker hue, but in our heavenly Father's sight, he is as dear as you. C is the cotton field to which this injured brother's driven, when as a white man's slave he toils from early morn till even. D is the driver, cold and stern, who follows whip in hand to punish those who dare to rest or disobey command. E is the eagle soaring high, an emblem of the free. But while we chain our brother man, our type he cannot be. F is the heart-sick fugitive, the slave who runs away, and travels through the dreary night, but hides himself by day. G is the gong, whose rolling sound before the morning light calls up the little sleeping slave to labor until night. H is the hound his master trained and called to scent the track of the unhappy fugitive and bring him trembling back. I is the infant from the arms of its fond mother torn and at a public auction sold with horses, cows, and corn. J is a jail upon whose floor that wretched mother lay until her cruel master came and carried her away. K is the kidnapper who stole that little child and mother, shrieking it clung around her, but he tore them from each other. L is the lash that brutally he swung around its head, threatening that if it cried again he'd whip it till twas dead. M is a merchant of the north who buys what slaves produce, so they are stolen, whipped and worked, for his and for our use. In is the negro, rambling free in his far distant home, delighting neath the palm tree's shade and coconut to roam. Oh, was the orange tree that bloomed beside his cabin door, when white men stole him from his home to see it nevermore. P is the parent, sorrowing and weeping all alone. The child he loved to lean upon, his only son, is gone. Q is the quarter where the slave on courses food is fed, and where, with toil and sorrow worn, he seeks his wretched bed. R is a rice swamp, dank and lone, where weary day by day, he labors till the fever wastes his strength and life away. S is the sugar that the slave is toiling hard to make, to put into your pie and tea, your candy, 
and your cake. Tea is the rank tobacco plant, raised by slave labor too, a poisonous and nasty thing for gentlemen to chew. You is for Upper Canada, where the poor slave is found, rest after all his wanderings, for it is British ground. V is the vessel in whose dark, noisome, and stifling hold hundreds of Africans are packed, brought o'er the seas and sold. W is the whipping post to which the slave is bound, while on his naked back the lash makes many a bleeding wound. X is for Xerxes, famed of yore, a warrior stern was he. He fought with swords, let truth and love our only weapons be. Why is for youth the time for all, bravely to war with sin, and think not it can ever be too early to begin? Z is a zealous man, sincere, faithful, and just, and true, an earnest pleader for the slave. Will you not be so too? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ballad of the Anti-Puritan by G. K. Chesterton Read for LibriVox.org by Joshua Letchford The Ballad of the Anti-Puritan by G. K. Chesterton They spoke of progress spiring round, of light and Mrs. Humphrey Ward. It is not true to say I frowned or ran about the room and roared. I might have simply sat and snored. I rose politely in the club and said, I feel a little bored. Will someone take me to a pub? The new world's wisest did surround me, and it pains me to record I did not think their views profound, or their conclusions well assured. The simple life I can't afford, besides, I do not like the grub. I want a mash and sausage scored. Will someone take me to a pub? I know where men can still be found, anger and clamorous accord, and virtues growing from the ground, and fellowship of beer and board, and song that is a sturdy cord, and hope that is a hardy shrub, and goodness that is God's last word. Will someone take me to a pub? Envoy. Prince, Bayard would have smashed his sword to see the sort of knights you dub. Is that the last of them? Oh Lord! Will someone take me to a pub? This is the end of the poem. This recording is in the public domain. Beef Tech au Champignon by Henry Augustine Beers. Read for LibriVox by Kalinda. Mimi, do you remember? Don't get behind your fan. That morning in September on the cliffs of Grand Munnel, where to the shock of fundi the topmost harebells sway, Campanula rotundi, folia C.F. Gray. On the pastures high and level that overlook the sea, where I wondered what the devil those little things could be that Mimi stooped to gather as she strolled across the down, and held her dress skirt rather... Oh, now, you needn't frown. For you know the dew was heavy, and your boots, I know, were thin. So a little extra brevity in skirts was, sure, no sin. Besides, who minds a cousin, first, second, even third? I've kissed em by the dozen, and they never once demurred. If one's allowed to ask it, quoth I, ma belle cousine, what have you in your basket, those baskets white and green, the brave Passamaquoddies weave out of scented grass, and sell to tourist bodies who through Mount Desert pass? You answered, slightly frowning, Put down your stupid book, that everlasting browning, and come and help me look. Mushroom, you speak him in English, I call him Champignon. I'll teach you to distinguish the right kind from the wrong. There was no fog on Fundy that blue September day. The west wind for that one day had swept it all away. The lighthouse glasses twinkled, the white gulls screamed and flew, the merry sheep bells tinkled, the merry breezes blew. The bayberry aromatic, the papery immortelle, that gave our grandma's attic that sentimental smell, tied up in little brush brooms, were sweet as new mown hay while we went hunting mushrooms that blue September day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Call by John Frederick Freeman. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Is it the wind that stirs the trees? 
is it the trees that scratch the wall is it the wall that shakes and mutters is it a dumb ghost's call the wind steals in and twirls the candle the branches heave and brush the wall but more than tree or wild wind mutters this night this night of all open a cry sounds and i gasp open and hands beat door and wall open and each dark echo mutters i rise a shape and shadow tall open across the room i falter and near the door crouch by the wall thrice bolt the door as the voice mutters open and frail strokes fall open the lights out and i shrink quaking and blind against the wall open no sound is yet it mutters within me now this night of all was it the wind that stirred the trees was it the trees that scratched the wall was it the wall that shook and muttered or love's last ghostly call end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Call of the Wild by Robert Service Read for LibriVox.org by Eileen Have you gazed on naked grandeur where there's nothing else to gaze on, set pieces and drop curtain scenes galore, big mountains heaved to heaven which the blinding sunsets blazon, black canyons where the rapids rip and roar? Have you swept the visioned valley with the green stream streaking through it, Search the vastness for a something you have lost. Have you strung your soul to silence? Then for God's sake go and do it. Hear the challenge, learn the lesson, pay the cost. Have you wandered in the wilderness, the sagebrush desolation, the bunch-grass levels where the cattle graze? Have you whistled bits of ragtime at the end of all creation and learned to know the desert's little ways? Have you camped upon the foothills? Have you galloped over the ranges? Have you roamed the arid sunlands through and through? Have you chummed up with the mesa? Do you know its moods and changes? Then listen to the wild, it's calling you. Have you known the great white silence, not a snow-gemmed twig a quiver, eternal truths that shame our soothing lies? Have you broken trail on snowshoes, mushed your huskies up the river, dared the unknown, led the way, and clutched the prize? Have you marked the map's void spaces, mingled with the mongrel races, felt the savage strength of brute in every thew? And though grim as hell the worst is, can you round it off with curses? Then hearken to the wild, it's wanting you. Have you suffered, starved, and triumphed, groveled down, yet grasped at glory, grown bigger in the bigness of the whole, done things just for the doing, letting babblers tell the story? Seeing through the nice veneer the naked soul? Have you seen God in his splendors, Heard the text that nature renders? You'll never hear it in the family pew. The simple things, the true things, The silent men who do things, Then listen to the wild, it's calling you. They have cradled you in custom, They have primed you with their preaching, They have soaked you in convention through and through. They have put you in a showcase, You're a credit to their teaching, but can't you hear the wild? It's calling you. Let us probe the silent places. Let us seek what luck betide us. Let us journey to a lonely land I know. There is a whisper on the night wind. There is a star agleam to guide us. And the wild is calling, calling. Let us go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Casey at the Bat by Ernest Thayer Read for LibriVox.org by Dirk Vanderwilt The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood 4-2 to two with but one inning left to play. And then, when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. 
A straggling few got up to go in deep despair, the rest clung to that hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a no-good, and the latter was a fake. So, upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted, and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn a hug in third. Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountain and recoiled up the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing, and a smile on Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt, t'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded as he wiped them on his shirt. Then, while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eyes. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it, in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire, shouted someone from the stand, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spheroid flew, but Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold, they saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dame on the Mower by Andrew Marvell Read for LibriVox.org by Algie Pug Perth, Western Australia Hark how the mower daemon sung With love of Juliana stung, While everything did seem to paint the scene more fit for his complaint. Like her fair eyes, the day was fair, but scorching like his amorous care. Sharp like his scythe, his sorrow was, and withered like his hopes, the grass. Oh, what unusual heats are here, which thus our sunburned meadows sear. The grasshopper its pipe gives awe, and hamstring frogs can dance no more. But in the brook, the green frog wades, and grasshoppers seek out the shades. Only the snake that kept within now glitters in its second skin. This heat the sun could never raise, nor dog star so inflame the days. It from a higher beauty growth, which burns the fields and mower both, which made the dog and makes the sun hotter than his own phaeton. Not July causeth these extremes, but Juliana's scorching beams. Tell me where I may pass the fires of the hot day, or hot desires. To what cool cave shall I descend, or to what gelid fountain bend? Alas, I look for ease in vain, when remedies themselves complain. No moisture but my tears do rest, nor cold but in her icy breast. How long wilt thou, fair shepherdess, esteem me, and my presence less? To thee the harmless snake I bring, disarmed of its teeth and sting, to thee chameleon's changing hue, and oak-leaves tipped with honey-dew. 
Yet thou, ungrateful, hast not sought, nor what they are, nor who them brought. I am the mower, Damon, known through all the meadows I have mown. On me the morn her dew distills, before her darling daffodils. And if at noon my toil me heat, the sun himself licks off my sweat, while, going home, the evening sweet in cowslip water bathes my feet. What, though the piping shepherd stock the plains with an unnumbered flock, this scythe of mine discovers wide more ground than all his sheep do hide. With this the golden fleece I shear of all these closes every year. And though in wool more poor than they, yet am I richer far in hay. Nor am I so deformed to sight, if in my scythe I looked right, in which I see my picture done as in a crescent moon the sun. The deathless fairies take me off to lead them in their dances soft, and when I tune myself to sing about me, they contract their ring. How happy might I still have mowed, had not love here his thistles sowed! But now I all the day complain, joining my labour to my pain, and with my scythe cut down the grass, yet still my grief is where it was. But when the iron blunter grows, sighing, I wet my scythe and woes. While thus he threw his elbow round, depopulating all the ground, and with his whistling scythe does cut each stroke between the earth and root, the edged steel by careless chance did into his own ankle glance, and there among the grass fell down by his own scythe the mower moan. Alas, said he, these hurts are slight to those that die by love's despite. With shepherd's purse and clown's all heel, the blood I stanch and wound I seal. Only for him no cure is found, whom Juliana's eyes do wound. Tis death alone that this must do, for death thou art a mower too. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dulce et decorum est by Wilfred Owen Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas-shells dropping softly behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's, sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Father, dear father by Henry Clay Work Read for LibriVox.org Tis the song of little Mary Standing in the barroom door While the shameful midnight revel Rages wildly as before. Father, dear father, come home with me now. The clock in the steeple strikes one. You said you were coming right home from the shop as soon as your day's work was done. 
Our fire has gone out, our house is all dark, and mother's been watching since tea, with poor brother Benny so sick in her arms and no one to help her but me. Come home, come home, come home, please, father, dear father, come home. Hear the sweet voice of the child, which the night winds repeat as they roam. Oh, who could resist this most plaintive of prayers? Please, father, dear father, come home. Father, dear father, come home with me now. The clock in the steeple strikes two. The night has grown colder, and Benny is worse, but he has been calling for you. Indeed he is worse. Ma says he will die, perhaps before morning shall dawn. And this is the message she sent me to bring. Come quickly, or he will be gone. Come home, come home, come home, please, father, dear father, come home. Hear the sweet voice of the child, which the night winds repeat as they roam. Oh, who could resist this most plaintive of prayers? Please, father, dear father, come home. Father, dear father, come home with me now. The clock in the steeple strikes three. The house is so lonely. The hours are so long for poor weeping mother and me. Yes, we are alone. Poor Benny is dead and gone with the angels of light. And these were the very last words that he said. I want to kiss Papa good night. Come home. Come home, come home, please, father, dear father, come home. Hear the sweet voice of the child, which the night winds repeat as they roam. Oh, who could resist this most plaintive of prayers? Please, father, dear father, come home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. THE GREEN EYE OF THE YELLOW GOD by J. Milton Hayes Read for LibriVox.org by The Story Girl There's a one-eyed yellow idol to the north of Katmandu. There's a little marble cross below the town. There's a broken-hearted woman tends the grave of mad Carew, and the yellow god forever gazes down. He was known as Mad Carew by the subs at Kathmandu. He was hotter than they felt inclined to tell. But for all his foolish pranks he was worshipped in the ranks, and the colonel's daughter smiled on him as well. He had loved her all along, with a passion of the strong. The fact that she loved him was plain to all. She was nearly twenty-one, and arrangements had begun to celebrate her birthday with a ball. He wrote to ask what present she would like from Mad Carew. They met next day as he dismissed a squad. And jestingly she told him then that nothing else would do but the green eye of the little yellow god. On the night before the dance, Mad Carew seemed in a trance, and they chaffed him as they puffed at their cigars. But for once he failed to smile, and he sat alone a while, then went out into the night beneath the stars. He returned before the dawn, with his shirt and tunic torn, and a gash across his temple dripping red. He was patched up right away, and he slept through all the day, and the colonel's daughter watched beside his bed. He woke at last, and asked if they could send his tunic through. She brought it, and he thanked her with a nod. He bade her search the pocket, saying, That's from Mad Carew. And she found the little green eye of the god. She upbraided poor Carew in the way that women do, though both her eyes were strangely hot and wet. 
But she wouldn't take the stone, and Mad Carew was left alone with the jewel that he'd chanced his life to get. When the ball was at its height, on that still and tropic night, she thought of him, and hastened to his room. As she crossed the barrack square she could hear the dreamy air of a waltz tune softly stealing through the gloom. His door was open wide, with silver moonlight shining through. The place was wet and slippery where she trod. An ugly knife lay buried in the heart of Mad Carew. Twas the vengeance of the little yellow god. There's a one-eyed yellow idol to the north of Kathmandu. There's a little marble cross below the town. There's a broken-hearted woman tends the grave of Mad Carew, and the yellow god forever gazes down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hangman at Home by Carl Sandburg Read for LibriVox.org by Delmar H. Dolbeer, Fort Worth, Texas What does a hangman think about when he goes home at night from work? When he sits down with his wife and children for a cup of coffee and a plate of ham and eggs, do they ask him if it was a good day's work and everything went well? Or do they stay off some topics and kill about the weather, baseball, politics, and the comic strips in the papers and the movies? Do they look at his hands when he reaches for the coffee or the ham and eggs? If the little ones say, Daddy, play horse, here's a rope, does he answer like a joke, I seen enough rope for today? Or does his face light up like a bonfire of joy, and does he say, It's a good and dandy world we live in? And if a white-faced moon looks in through a window where a baby girl sleeps, and the moon gleams mix with baby ears and baby hair, the hangman, how does he act then? It must be easy for him. Anything is easy for a hangman, I guess. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug. Perth, Western Australia. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind, and in the mist of tears I hid from him and under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot, precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee, who betrayest me. I pleaded, outlaw-wise, by many a hearted casement, curtained red, trellised with intertwining charities, for though I knew his love who followed, Yet was I sore a dread, lest, having him, I must have naught beside. But if one little casement parted wide, the gust of his approach would clash it too. Fear wist not to evade, as love wist to pursue. Across the margin to the world I fled, and troubled the gold gateways of the stars, smiting for shelter on their clangored bars fretted to dulcet jars and sylvan chatter the pale ports of the moon i said to dawn be sudden to eve be soon with thy young sky blossoms heap me over from this tremendous lover float thy vague veil about me lest he see i tempted all his servitors but to find my own betrayal in their constancy 
in faith to him, their fickleness to me, their traitorous trueness, and their loyal deceit. To all swift things for swiftness did I sue, clung to the whistling mane of every wind, but whether they swept smoothly fleet the long savannas of the blue, or whether, thunder-driven, they clanged his chariot's water heaven, plashy with flying lightnings round the spurn of their feet, Fear wist not to evade as love wist to pursue. Still, with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, came on the following feet, and a voice above there beat, Nought shelters thee who will not shelter me. I sought no more that after which I strayed in face of man or maid, but still within the little children's eyes seems something, something that replies, They at least are for me, surely for me. I turned me to them very wistfully, But just as their young eyes grew sudden fair, With dawning answers there, The angel plucked them from me by the hair. Come then, ye other children, natures, Share with me, said I, your delicate fellowship, Let me greet you lip to lip, let me twine with you caresses, wantoning, with our lady mother's vagrant tresses, banqueting, with her in her wind-walled palace, underneath her azure dais, quaffing as your taintless way is from a chalice, lucent weeping out of the day-spring. So it was done, I in the delicate fellowship was one, drew the bolt of nature's secrecies, I knew all the swift importings on the wilful face of skies. I knew how the clouds arise, spumed of the wild sea snortings. All that's born or dies, rose and drooped with. Made them shapers of mine own moods, or wailful, or divine. With them joyed, and was bereaven. I was heavy with the even, when she lit her glimmering tapers round the day's dead sanctities. I laughed in the morning's eyes, I triumphed, and I saddened with all weather, Heaven and I wept together, and its sweet tears were salt with mortal mine. Against the red throb of its sunset heart I laid my own to beat, and share commingling heat, but not by that, by that was eased my human smart. In vain my tears were wet on heaven's great cheek, for ah, we know not what each other says, these things and I. In sound I speak, their sound is but their stir, they speak by silences. Nature, poor step-dame, cannot slake my drouth. Let her, if she would owe me, drop yon blue bosom veil of sky, and show me the breasts of her tenderness. Never did any milk of hers once bless my thirsting mouth. Nigh and nigh draws the chase, with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, and past those noised feet a voice comes yet more fleet. Lo, naught contents thee, who contentest not me. Naked I wait thy love's uplifted stroke, my harness piece by piece thou hast hewn from me, and smitten me to my knee. I am defenceless utterly, I slept, methinks, and woke, and slowly gazing find me stripped in sleep. In the rash lustihood of my young powers, I shook the pillaring hours, and pulled my life upon me. Grimed with smears, I stand amid the dust of the mounded years. My mangled youth lies dead beneath the heap. My days have crackled and gone up in smoke, have puffed and burst as sun starts on a stream. Yea, faileth now even dream the dreamer, and the lute the lutinist, even the linked fantasies, in whose blossomy twist I swung the earth a trinket at my wrist, are yielding, cords of all too weak account, for earth with heavy griefs so overplussed. Ah, is thy love indeed a weed, albeit an amaranthine weed, suffering no flowers except its own to mount? Ah, must, designer infinite, Ah, must thou char the wood, Ere thou canst limb with it? 
My freshness spent its wavering shower i' the dust, And now my heart is as a broken fount, Wherein tear-dripping stagnate, Spilt down ever from the dank thoughts that shiver Upon the sifal branches of my mind. Such is, what is to be, The pulp so bitter, how shall taste the rind? I dimly guess what time in mists confounds, Yet ever and anon a trumpet sounds From the hid battlements of eternity. Those shaken mists a space unsettle, Then round the half-glimpsed turrets Slowly wash again, But not ere him who summoneth I first have seen, Enwound with glooming rose purpureal, Cypress crowned. His name I know, and what his trumpet saith, whether man's heart or life it be which yields thee harvest, must thy harvest fields be dunged with rotten death? Now of that long pursuit comes on at hand the brute, that voice is round me like a bursting sea. And is thy earth so marred, shattered in shard on shard? Lo, all things fly thee, for thou fliest me. Strange, piteous, futile thing! Wherefore should any set thee love apart? Seeing none but I makes much of naught, he said, And human love needs human meriting. How hast thou merited, of all man's clotted clay, The dingiest clot? Alack, thou knowest not how little worthy Of any love thou art. Whom wilt thou find to love ignoble thee, Save me, save only me? All which I took from thee I did but take not for thy harms, but just that thou mightst seek it in my arms. All that which thy child's mistake fancies as lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Halts by me that footfall, is my gloom after all, shade of his hand, outstretched caressingly. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou dravest love from thee, who dravest me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If by Rudyard Kipling, read for LibriVox.org by Rhonda Fetterman. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster And treat those two impostors just the same, If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken Twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, Or watch the things you gave your life to, Broken, and stoop and build them up with worn-out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings And risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose, and start again at your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, Hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I know an old man constrained to dwell by William Wordsworth read for librivox.org by Rhonda Fetterman 
I know an aged man constrained to dwell in a large house of public charity, where he abides, as in a prisoner's cell with numbers near, alas, no company. When he could creep about at will, though poor and forced to live on alms, this old man fed a redbreast, one that to his cottage door came not, but in a lane partook his bread. There, at the root of one particular tree, an easy seat this worn-out laborer found, while Robin pecked the crumbs upon his knee, laid one by one, or scattered on the ground. Dear intercourse was theirs, day after day. What signs of mutual gladness when they met! Think of their common peace, their simple play, the parting moment and its fond regret. Months passed in love that failed not to fulfill, in spite of season's change, its own demand, by fluttering pinions here and busy bill, thereby caresses from a tremulous hand. Thus in the chosen spot a tie so strong was formed between the solitary pair, that when his fate had housed him mid a throng, the captive shunned all converse proffered there. Wife, children, kindred, they were dead and gone. But if no evil hap his wishes crossed, one living stay was left, and on that one some recompense for all that he had lost. Oh, that the good old man had power to prove, by message sent through air or visible token, that still he loves the bird, and still must love, that friendship lasts though fellowship is broken. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady of Shalott by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Eileen. On either side the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky, and through the field the road runs by to many-towered Camelot. There up and down the people go, gazing where the lilies blow, round an island there below, the island of Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver, through the wave that runs for ever, by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four grey walls and four grey towers overlook a space of flowers, and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. By the margin, willow veiled, slide the heavy barges trailed, by slow horses and unhailed, the shallop flitted silken sailed, skimming down to Camelot. But who hath seen her wave her hand, or at the casement seen her stand, or is she known in all the land, the Lady of Shalott? Only reapers, reaping early, in among the bearded barley, hear a song that echoes cheerly, from the river winding clearly, down to towered Camelot. And by the moon the reaper weary, piling sheaves in uplands airy, listening, whispers, "'Tis the fairy, the Lady of Shalott." There she weaves by night and day, a magic web with colors gay. She hath heard a whisper say, a curse is on her if she stay to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily. Little other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. And moving through a mirror clear, that hangs before her all the year, shadows of the world appear, there she sees the highway near, winding down to Camelot. There the river eddy whirls, and there the surly village churls, and the red cloaks of market girls, pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot and an ambling pad, sometimes a curly shepherd lad, or long-haired page in crimson clad, goes by toward Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two, she hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights, to weave the mirror's magic sights, for often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights 
and music went to Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers lately wed. I'm half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. A bow shot from her bower eaves, he rode between the barley sheaves, the sun came dazzling through the leaves, and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight for ever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on the yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridled glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see, hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily as he rode down to Camelot, and from his blazoned baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather burned like one burning flame together as he rode down to Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over still Shalott. His broad clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hoofs his war-horse trode, from underneath his helmet flowed his coal-black curls as on he rode, as he rode down to Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lyra by the river sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water-lily bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume, she looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide, the mirror cracked from side to side. The curses come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining, over towered Camelot. Down she came and found a boat, beneath a willow left afloat, and round about the prow she wrote, the Lady of Shalott and down the river's dim expanse, like some bold seer in a trance, seeing all his own mischance, with a glassy countenance did she look to Camelot. And at the closing of the day she loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. Lying robed in snowy white, that loosely flew to left and right, the leaves upon her falling light through the noises of the night, she floated down to Camelot. And as the boat head wound along, the willowy hills and fields among, they heard her singing her last song, the Lady of Shalott. Heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, Singing in her song she died, the Lady of Shalott. Under tower and balcony, by garden wall and gallery, A gleaming shape she floated by, dead pale between the houses high, Silent into Camelot. Out upon the wharves they came, knight and burgher, lord and dame, And round the prow they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. Who is this, and what is here, and in the lighted palace near, died the sound of royal cheer, and they crossed themselves for fear, all the knights at Camelot. But Lancelot mused a little space. He said, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace, the Lady of Shalott. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Love to Faults is Always Blind by William Blake Read for LibriVox by James Robbins Love to Faults is Always Blind Always is to Joy inclined Lawless, winged, and unconfined And breaks all chains from every mind Deceit, to secrecy confined Lawful, cautious, and refined to everything but interest blind and forges fetters for the mind end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Not to Keep by Robert Frost Recorded for LibriVox.org by Ruth Golding They sent him back to her. The letter came saying, and she could have him, and before she could be sure there was no hidden ill under the formal writing, he was in her sight, living. They gave him back to her alive. How else? They are not known to send the dead and not disfigured visibly. His face, his hands, she had to look, to ask, what was it, dear? And she had given all, and still she had all. They had, they the lucky. Wasn't she glad now? Everything seemed one, and all the rest for them permissible ease. She had to ask, what was it, dear? Enough, yet not enough. A bullet through and through high in the breast. Nothing but what good care and medicine and rest and you a week can cure me of to go again. The same grim giving to do over for them both. She dared no more than ask him with her eyes how was it with him for a second trial. And with his eyes he asked her not to ask. They had given him back to her, but not to keep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. October's Bright Blue Weather by Helen Hunt Jackson Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio, on Columbus Day, 2011. O suns and skies and clouds of June, and flowers of June together, ye cannot rival for one hour October's bright blue weather. When loud the bumblebee makes haste, belated, thriftless, vagrant, and goldenrod is dying fast, and lanes with grapes are fragrant. When gentians roll their fingers tight to save them for the morning, and chestnuts fall from satin burrs without a sound of warning. When on the ground red apples lie in piles like jewels shining, and redder still on old stone walls are leaves of woodbine twining. When all the lovely wayside things their white-winged seeds are sowing, and in the fields, still green and fair, late aftermaths are growing. When springs run low, and on the brooks in idle golden freighting, bright leaves sink noiseless in the hush of woods for winter waiting. When comrades seek sweet country haunts, by twos and twos together, and count like misers hour by hour October's bright blue weather. O sun and skies and flowers of June, count all your boasts together. Love loveth best of all the year October's bright blue weather. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to Napoleon Bonaparte by George Gordon Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Kalinda Ode to Napoleon Bonaparte Tis done. But yesterday a king, and armed with kings to strive, and now thou art a nameless thing, so abject, yet alive. Is this the man of thousand thrones who strewed our earth with hostile bones, and can he thus survive? Since he miscalled the morning star, nor man nor fiend hath fallen so far. Ill-minded man, why scourge thy kind who bowed so low the knee? By gazing on thyself grown blind, thou taughtest the rest to see. With might unquestioned, power to save, 
Thine only gift hath been the grave, To those that worshipped thee. Nor till thy fall could mortals guess Ambitions less than littleness. Thanks for that lesson. It will teach to after-warriors More than high philosophy can preach, And vainly preached before. That spell upon the minds of men Breaks never to unite again, That led them to adore Those pagged things of sabre sway With fronts of brass and feet of clay. The triumph and the vanity, the rapture of the strife, The earthquake voice of victory, to thee the breath of life, The sword, the scepter, and that sway which man seemed made but to obey, Wherewith renown was rife, all quelled. Dark spirit, what must be the madness of thy memory? The desolator desolate, the victor overthrown, The arbiter of others' fate a suppliant for his own. Is it some yet imperial hope That with such change can calmly cope, Or dread of death alone? To die a prince, or live a slave, Thy choice is most ignobly brave. He who of old would rend the oak Dreamed not of the rebound, Chained by the trunk he vainly broke alone. How looked he round? Thou, in the sternness of thy strength, An equal deed hast done at length, And darker fate hast found. He fell, the forest prowler's prey, But thou must eat thy heart away. The Roman, when his burning heart Was slaked with blood of Rome, Threw down the dagger, dared depart, In savage grandeur, home. He dared depart in utter scorn Of men that such a yoke had borne, Yet left him such a doom. His only glory was that hour Of self-upheld, abandoned power. The Spaniard, when the lust of sway had lost its quickening spell, cast crowns for rosaries away, an empire for a cell. A strict accountant of his beads, a subtle disputant on creeds, his dotage trifled well. Yet better had he neither known a bigot's shrine nor despot's throne. But thou, from thy reluctant hand the thunderbolt is wrung, too late thou leav'st the high command to which thy weakness clung. All evil spirit as thou art, it is enough to grieve the heart to see thine own unstrung, to think that God's fair world hath been the footstool of a thing so mean, and earth hath spilt her blood for him who thus can hoard his own. And monarchs bowed the trembling limb and thanked him for a throne. Fair freedom we may hold thee dear when thus thy mightiest foes their fear in humblest guise have shown. Oh, ne'er may tyrant leave behind a brighter name to lure mankind. Thine evil deeds are writ in gore, nor written thus in vain. Thy triumphs tell of fame no more, or deepen every stain. If thou hadst died as honor dies, some new Napoleon might arise to shame the world again. But who would soar the solar height to set in such a starless night? Weighed in the balance, hero dust is vile as vulgar clay. Thy scales, mortality, are just to all that pass away. But yet, Methought the living great some higher sparks should animate to dazzle and dismay, nor deemed contempt could thus make mirth of these the conquerors of the earth. And she, proud Austria's mournful flower, thy still imperial bride, how bears her breast the torturing hour? Still clings she to thy side? Must she too bend? Must she too share thy late repentance, long despair, thou throneless homicide? If still she loves thee, hoard that gem, Tis worth thy vanished diadem. Then haste thee to thy sullen isle, And gaze upon the sea, That element may meet thy smile, It ne'er was ruled by thee. Or trace with thine all idle hand, In loitering mood upon the sand, That earth is now as free, That Corinth's pedagogue hath now Transferred his byword to thy brow. Thou Timur in his captive's cage, What thought will there be thine, While brooding in thy prisoned rage, but one, the world was mine. Unless, like he of Babylon, All sense is with thy scepter gone, Life will not long confine that spirit Poured so widely forth, so long obeyed, So little worth. Or, like the thief of fire from heaven, Wilt thou withstand the shock, And share with him the unforgiven, His vulture and his rock? Fordoomed by God, by man accursed, And that last act, though not thy worst, The very fiend's arch mock, he in his fall preserved his pride, And if a mortal, had as proudly died. There was a day, there was an hour, While earth was Gaul's, Gaul thine, 
when that immeasurable power unsated to resign had been an act of purer fame than gathers round marengo's name and gilded thy decline through the long twilight of all time despite some passing clouds of crime but thou forsooth must be a king and don the purple vest as if that foolish robe could wing remembrance from thy breast where is that faded garment where the gugas thou wert fond to wear the star the string the crest vain froward child of empire say are all thy playthings snatched away where may the wearied eye repose when gazing on the great where neither guilty glory glows nor despicable state yes one the first the last the best the cincinnatus of the west whom envy dared not hate bequeathed the name of washington to make man blush there was but one End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Strange Meeting by Wilfred Owen. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. It seemed that out of the battle I escaped down some profound, dull tunnel long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there encumbered sleepers groaned, too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition in fixed eyes, lifting distressful hands as if to bless. And by his smile I knew that sullen hall. With a thousand fears that vision's face was grained, yet no blood reached there from the upper ground, and no guns thumped or down the flues made moan. Strange friend, I said, here is no cause to mourn. None, said the other, save the undone years, the hopelessness. Whatever hope is yours was my life also. I went hunting wild after the wildest beauty in the world, which lies not calm in eyes or braided hair, but mocks the steady running of the hour, and if it grieves, grieves richlier than here. For by my glee might many men have laughed, and of my weeping something has been left which must die now i mean the truth untold the pity of war the pity war distilled now men will go content with what we spoiled or of discontent boil bloody and be spilled they will be swift with swiftness of the tigress none will break ranks though nations trek from progress courage was mine and i had mystery wisdom was mine and i had mastery to miss the march of this retreating world into vain citadels that are not walled then when much blood had clogged their chariot wheels i would go up and wash them from sweet wells even with truths that lie too deep for taint i would have poured my spirit without stint but not through wounds not on the cess of war forids of men have bled where no wounds were i am the enemy you killed my friend i knew you in this dark for so you frowned yesterday through me as you jabbed and killed i parried but my hands were loath and cold let us sleep now end of poem this recording is in the public domain summer night by Alfred Lord Tennyson, read for LibriVox.org by Martin Geeson, in Hazelmere, Surrey. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white, nor waves the cypress in the palace walk, nor winks the gold fin in the porphyry font. The firefly wakens, waken thou with me now droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost and like a ghost she glimmers on to me now lies the earth all danae to the stars and all thy heart lies open unto me now slides the silent meteor on and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me now folds the lily all her sweetness up 
and slips into the bosom of the lake so fold thyself my dearest thou and slip into my bosom and be lost in me end of poem this recording is in the public domain come and kiss me sweet and twenty by paul lawrence dunbar read for LibriVox.org by rick rodney on october sixth two thousand eleven in waynesboro virginia apple blossoms falling o'er thee and the month is may laden boughs bend low before thee with their gentle sway look you where the thrush is swinging how his melody is ringing as he sings my heart is singing come and kiss me sweet and twenty love blooms out with flowers aplenty love me love me without reason kiss me now's the kissing season white your cheek is as the blooms are sweet your breath as perfumes are is this dolce far niente come and kiss me sweet and twenty love is at thy window suing all the livelong day stay and listen to my wooing life shall all be may love like mine can falter never not from thee my heart can sever and my song shall be forever come and kiss me sweet and twenty love blooms out with flowers aplenty love me love me without reason kiss me now is the kissing season white your cheek is as the blooms are sweet your breath as perfumes are is this dolce far niente come and kiss me sweet and twenty end of poem this recording is in the public domain this world fares as a fantasy by anonymous read for librivox dot org by martin geeson he wold a witten of some wee swicht witterly what this world were it fareth as a fool's flicht nu is it hen nu is it hare ne bear we never so much of micht nu bear we on bench nu bear we on bear and bear we never so war and wicht nu bear we sick no bear we fair no is own prood with oot and pair no is the self he set not be and hoes wall all a thing hertly hair this world fareth as a fantasy the sunne's course we my well ken ariseth est and geth doon west the rivers into the sea they ren and it is never the more al mest windes rosheth hair and hen in snows and rain is non arrest when this wall stunt o what or when but only god on grun the grest the earth in own is ever pressed no be dropped no al dree but uch gom glit forth as a guest this world fareth as a fantasy cunredes cum and cunredes gon as joineth generations but all her passeth every chon for all her preparations some are for yet a clean as born among all maner nations so shall men think an us nothing on that no hand the occupations and all those disputations i the lich all us occupie for christ maketh the creations and this world fareth as a fantasie which is mon o what and what whether that he be ocht or nocht of earth and air groweth up a gnat and so doth man when all his sort doch man be waxen great and fat 
mon melteth away so doth the mocht mon as micht nis worth the mat but nuyeth himself and turneth to nocht ho what sav he that all hath rocht where mon becometh one he shall die ho knoweth be dead ocht bought be bought for this word fareth as a fantasy dies mon and best as die and all is own occasion and all o death hos both dree and han own incarnation save that men both more slay all is o comparison ho what if mon a soul a steer and best a soul a sinketh down ho knoweth best zentention on her creature ho thy cree save only god that knoweth her soon for this world fareth as a fantasy which sect hopeth to be save baldly be her believe and which on upon god her crave we should a god with him him grave which on troweth that other rave but alla her chooseth god for chave and hope in god which on thy have and be her wit her watching prave thus mony matters men do mave such in her wits who and he but god's mercy us all behave for this world fareth as a fantasy for thus men stumble and sear her wits and maveth matters money and fell some leveth on him some leveth on it as children learneth for to spell but none saith none that a beat when still he death will on him stell for he that hext in heaven a sit he is the help and hope of hell for woe is end of world as well which leaf look where that he lee this world is false fickle and frail and fareth but as a fantasy wartow will no effort now the pointes of god's privete more than him lustness for to show where should not knaw in no degree and idle boast is for to blow a maister of divinity think we live in earth her low and god on high in majesty of material mortuality medle away and of no more maestri the more we truss the trinity the more we fall in fantasy but leve we o'er disputy soon and leve on him that all hath wrought we mo not breve be no reason who he was born that all us bought but hall in our intention worship we him in heart and thought for he might turn kindes up sedun that all kindes mad of nocht when all our bokes ben forth brocht and all our craft of clergy and all our wittes ben thorch out socht yet we fareth as a fantasy of fantasy is all our far old and young and ally fair but mark we murray and slay car and worship we god will we ben hair spend our good and little spar and uch mon cherries others cheer think who we come and hither all bar or why when ding is in a ware pry we the prince that hath no pair 
Tacus Hall to his mercy, and keep our conscience clear, for this world is but fantasy. Be ensemble, men may say, a great trail groweth out of the ground. No thing abated the earth will be, though it be huge, great and round. Richt there will rotten the selve tre, when eld hath mad his quind a swound. Doch there were a rot such tre, the earth will not increase a pound. Thus waxeth and wanteth man, horse and hound. From nocht to nocht, thus henne we he, and here we stunteth but a stund. For this world is but fantasy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To an Athlete Dying Young by A. E. Houseman. Read for LibriVox.org by Miss Avarice. The time you won your town the race, we chaired you through the marketplace. Man and boy stood cheering by, and home we brought you shoulder high. Today the road all runners come, shoulder high we bring you home, and set you at your threshold down, townsman of a stiller town. Smart lad to slip betimes away from fields where glory does not stay, and early though the laurel grows, it withers quicker than the rose. Eyes the shady night has shut, cannot see the record cut, and silence sounds no worse than cheers after earth has stopped the ears. Now you will not swell the rout of lads that wore their honors out, runners whom renown outran, and the name died before the man. So set, before its echoes fade, the fleet foot on the sill of shade, and hold to the low lintel up the still defended challenge cup. And round that early laurelled head will flock to gaze the strengthless dead, and find unwithered on its curls the garland briefer than a girl's. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When You Are Old by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Terry Roars When you're old and gray and full of sleep And nodding by the fire, take down this book And slowly read and dream of the soft look Your eyes had once and of their shadows deep How many loved your moments of glad grace And loved your beauty with love false or true but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you, and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled, and paced upon the mountains overhead, and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.